Hello everyone and welcome back to this next lecture in the machine simulation series and this is where we are left off last week or the week before that where it introduced the Fleming's left hand rule. So this Fleming's left hand rule is also known as the motor rule and this is specifically used to find out the direction in which force is produced when an external magnetic field acts on a current carrying conductor. Right? So this is how we have to hold it and we used this rule or at least I demonstrated how you can use this rule in our special case where we had considered an elect an external magnetic field external magnetic field which is acting on a current carrying conductor and we saw that we can use this Fleming's left hand rule to determine the direction which the force is and we had also determined the direction of force using just trying to figure out what the interaction between the magnetic lines of force would result in. Right. Now, in this today's lecture, we are going to carry on and use this Fleming's left hand rule in the motor that we have considered so far. Because we know the direction of the current and we also know the direction of the magnetic flux. So, let us use this in today's lecture. So, as always, a little bit of brief background that if you are interested in these kind of video lectures, but you would like something a little more comprehensive, I do have full length online courses which you can access on my website which is pythonpowerelectronics.com that is the name of the project followed by .com. So all you have to do is go to this button learn and this will take you to the list of courses which are currently available. So I have five courses. The very first course is simulating power electronic circuits using Python and in this I talk about the basics of how you can use Python and Python power electronics to simulate basic power electronic circuits. So the second course is basics of digital signal processing for power engineers and in this I talk about how you can use Python and packages such as the signal package within SciPy to analyze and design filters for power engineering applications. The third course I have is simulation of magnetics for power electronics using Python and in this I talk about how you can use Python and Python power electronics to model and simulate magnetic components such as inductors, coupled inductors and transformers. The fourth course I have is called control, control analysis with Python for grid connected converters and in this I talk about how you can use Python and packages such as the Python control package to design and analyze control, controllers for power electronic applications with the specific example of a single phase converter connected to a single phase grid. And the last course I have is called why specialize in power electronics and in this I talk about how you can use why is power electronics important and this is a free course which is targeted towards either high school students or towards junior undergraduates who have not yet chosen their domain of specialization. And the purpose of this course is to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities which are currently available in power electronics so that junior students can choose power electronics as their domain of specialization. So all these courses are available on two platforms that is Decibels Lab and Udemy and if you click on either of these two buttons anywhere it will take you to the link to the link for the course. So the link for this page is available in the description of this video. If you are interested please do check it out. So I will now get back to the lecture. So as I said we are going to use this law on the motor. So again to recap this law it is important that we always use the left hand and not the right hand because the right hand is the generator rule. Right, which we might think about, which we might talk about later. But it is the left hand that you must use and it's important that you hold the thumb, the forefinger and the middle finger at 90 degrees to each other. Right, All three must be at 90 degrees to each other resembling an X, Y and Z axis. In that case, the forefinger indicates the direction of the magnetic field. The middle finger indicates the direction of the current flowing in the current carrying conductor and the thumb will indicate the direction of the force that is applied on this current carrying conductor. Right. So with this recap let's go over to our diagram right? and we've already used this. Right. This was our, this was the one which we had used for demonstration purposes. Now that we have done this let's go over to our own circuit which we had used for mapping the lines on this on the motor.
So for example, here we had done two, as you can see. We had said that if we can represent the stator of the induction motor, which is the outermost concentric circle. So the outermost two concentric circles resembles the stator of the induction motor. And if we can resemble the stator windings, which are distributed all over the stator by a single slot, that means you have several of stator windings in this one slot, and this one slot, these two, or rather these two slots are diametrically opposite each other. Then in that case, we can say that this simplified representation of the induction motor will result in such a flux path. All right. Now, of course, we can also assume a direction. That is, if we say that the current in the upper slot is flowing into the page, then in that case, the magnetic lines of force produced by the upper slot will be in the clockwise direction. And if this, in this slot, lower slot, if the current were to be flowing out of the page, then the magnetic lines of force will be in the counterclockwise direction. Right? So, and of course, there was also this one here. So, therefore, we had also seen that this is the magnetic lines of force which are produced by the rotor and how they, when the rotor is excited. So, now that we have these, right, it is quite clear that we can use the same method or rather the same learnings from this diagram into this diagram. However, it is just, I think, that we should look at the mutual mutual inductions rather. So let me just pull that out. This is the mutual inductance now. Well, I guess this is good enough. So now, how do we do this? I'm going to save this file. I'm going to call this flux lines force. So. In this diagram, we're going to make some changes because as I said, we need to know how the force, for example, let's consider this one, but we need to know how the force is going to act on this, on this uh, rotor. So for example, let me go over. Okay, I've grouped the whole thing, so I may have to ungroup it. And this is better. So let me just delete some of these lines. and these as well, right? So if we were to assume, right, that there is a magnetic field produced by the stator on the rotor, right? So therefore, the stator is producing the magnetic field and for this rotor, which is carrying a current, this magnetic field is an external magnetic field, right? It's mutual inductance. But here we are not talking about inductance, we are talking about force because the current is already flowing in the conductor and we want to know what is the force which will be exerted due to this external magnetic field on this current carrying the rotor conductor. So, now, we've already talked about this flux path and we've seen that the major reluctance, this is the air gap, the major reluctance to the flux path is the air gap, right? The flux path, the reluctance to the flux path due to this ion is negligible because the permeability of ion is 1000 times greater than the permeability of air. So with this reluctance of the air gap being the main component that offers reluctance to this passage of flux, it is important to know that we must map the magnetic flux through this air gap in a reasonably effective manner. Now. How will we do that? Again, as I've already spoken, and I realize this circle is not really displaced. I think now it is more perfectly concentric. It was really displaced. Okay, let's get back. So, now the next question to be asked is, to determine that, we must ask the question, how will the magnetic flux flow? And the same goes for current, the same goes for water, that they will always choose the path of least resistance or in this case, the flux will choose the path of least reluctance. Now, the question therefore is, if we say that this, the air gap is the one that produces the maximum reluctance, when is the reluctance of this air, of any path through the air gap the minimum? 
And the question, the answer is when this lies along the radius, right? When it lies along the radius. So, for example, if I were to imagine a flux path passing through at any point here, then in that case, if I draw, if I draw a magnetic, if I draw a line that resembles the magnetic flux across the air gap, then in that case, it would be along the radius, right? So, let's choose one here. This is the this is one magnetic line of force, right? And of course, it extends. It will extend and then it will complete its path the other way. Now, let's now draw a little away from this. And again, it follows the radius. So, therefore, if we map the radius, then you can say it is in this direction. Unfortunately, it is refusing to let me do it. So, let me just use a free hand. Right? This is the magnetic line of force. And here too, you can say the same. So, basically, these are all going along the radius. And they are joining here, but they shouldn't be joining. This is an error. The only reason why they are joining is because the drawing software assumes that they are all the same. But what is important here is that because you have them all along the radius, you can actually represent all the magnetic lines of force which are affecting this conductor by a single line of force because they will all have an equivalent. And that equivalent you can see is along the radius at which this conductor lies, right? So, I could actually delete all these and just leave this on, right? And this one will of course have a direction. Actually, the direction is in the other way because we saw now the other way. Let me just undo this. And it should be the other way because remember, we have assumed here that the current flows into the page. So, the magnetic lines of force are in the counterclockwise direction. So, the flux is actually flowing upwards. And here, you will see exactly the opposite. That is, the flux is flowing into it. So, what is the conclusion of this? The conclusion of this is that we are seeing that the magnetic line of force which is acting on this conductor can be represented by a single line of equal or rather a single equivalent line of force which acts along the radius. So, we have a very definite direction for the magnetic line of force which is acting on this current carrying conductor. And when that happens, that means magnet Fleming's left hand rule can be applied. So, here again, let us see what we can do. Supposing, for example, we say that this magnetic line of force, so therefore this current we say is flowing inwards. It is flowing inwards, it is producing this magnetic lines of force in the clockwise direction. Now, it is inducing a current in this rotor. Again, we are assuming a squirrel gauge motor. If it is a if it is a wound rotor motor, then this rotor can be excited separately. But we are not looking into that yet. This is a squirrel cage motor. So, this whatever current is flowing in the rotor is induced because of the magnetic flux produced by the stator. Now, if it is induced by the magnetic flux produced by the stator, then according to Lenz's law, the direction will be such so as to oppose the cause which produces it. Right? So, if this was an increasing magnetic flux due to an increasing current, flowing inside this inside this slot, then in that case, this current here would also have to be increasing but flowing upwards out of the page such that it produces a magnetic flux which opposes the change in this magnetic flux, right? So, therefore, this current will be in the, will be coming out of the page. So, again, we have ascertained the direction of the current flowing in the current carrying conductor. So, let us now use magnet Fleming's left hand rule. We know that we can point the forefinger in the direction of the magnetic field. We can use the, we can use our middle finger to be in the direction of the current carrying conductor which is out of the page, right? In my case, it is out of the laptop. Which means the thumb, outstretched thumb points in the direction of the magnetic force. 
right? I would suggest that you do it on your own because I can't draw a hand here. It's almost impossible. But if we consider the fourth finger to be the X axis, the middle finger to be the Y axis and the Z axis to be the thumb, then quite obviously you will see the direction of force is in this direction. Right. Now let's come over here and have a look. If again we are using the same rule, we are saying that the forefinger is in the direction of the magnetic field. The current carrying conductor, now here the current is flowing out of the page, is into the page, sorry, it is into the page because again we are using the same lenses law to determine the direction of the current which means that now this magnetic line, this force applied on this conductor will be in this direction. Right? So we now have a direction of force for the upper, for the upper conductor in the rotor and the lower conductor in the rotor. And once you have a look and see that these are the directions when the force exists, it is very clear that because of these direction of force, there is a torque acting on the rotor and that torque is trying to rotate the rotor in this anti-clockwise direction, counterclockwise direction, right? So, we now can clearly see that because of all this, because of the magnetic produced by, magnetic flux produced by the stator, which induces a current in the rotor and produces a current in the rotor, there is now a force acting on this rotor. And this force is going to try to rotate the rotor in this counterclockwise direction. And this is the very fundamental principle of any induction motor. This is how any motor works. And in specific, this is how a squirrel cage induction motor works. So, with this, I am going to end this lecture. Because now, with this, we talked about how torque is produced and the direction in which it is produced. But, we still have not talked about how we can actually write a mathematical equation for the torque. And for that, we have to bring in a few more laws of physics, which we will do in the next few lectures. So, as always, if you have any doubts, feel free to either send me an email or message me on social media, whichever is your preference. Otherwise, I will see you next week where we will continue with this lecture and we will try to start writing equations for the weight for the torque that is produced. So, thank you so much for listening and goodbye for now.